In this part of the video, we will review properties of magnetic force and the equations that describe it. In the previous video, we outlined two core ideas that help us understand interactions of moving electric charges. We first said that any moving charge or current creates magnetic field around it. Whenever there is a second charge placed inside the magnetic field, it will feel the magnetic force. Experiments show that this force is perpendicular both to the velocity of moving charge V and the magnetic field B. Thus, all sketches of vectors must be three-dimensional. For example, if vectors V and F are in the plane of the screen, the vector B must point out of the plane of the screen. To sketch such three-dimensional distributions, we will introduce an arrow notation. Imagine that each vector is an arrow that has a tip and fletching or fins. Then we can draw the vectors that point perpendicular to the screen as follows. If the vector points out of the screen, we see its tip. We draw it as a circle inside another circle. If the vector points into the screen, we see its fletching. We draw it as a little cross inside the circle. For example, in the shown figure, vector B points out of the screen. To find the magnetic force, we use the following equation. F equals Q times V cross B. Here F is the magnetic force. Q is the electric charge that feels the force. V is the velocity of this charge. And B is the magnetic field. This vector equation gives both the length and direction of the force. If phi is the angle between V and B, then the length of the force is F is equal to Q times absolute value of B times the absolute value of B times sine of the phi. The direction of F is found using the right-hand rule. The right-hand rule determines the direction of the cross product vector A cross B of two vectors A and B as illustrated in this diagram. We will practice with applying the right-hand rule during the class. According to this equation, magnetic force has quite weird properties. First of all, it is always perpendicular to the velocity of the charge experiencing the force. This means that magnetic force does no work on the charge. If we calculate a, a elementary work a, along a small displacement ds, dwb is equal to f times ds. Using the formula for the magnetic force, we find that this um, work is equal to Q times V cross B times V times DT. So this is a mixed product that includes V twice. And consequently, you can easily show that this cross product is zero. So this means that magnetic force never does work on the charge. It cannot change kinetic energy, which stays the same. And also can be shown that it cannot be associated with a potential energy. Finally, as we already mentioned, magnetic force does not obey Newton's third law. So magnetic force often results in a circular motion of charges, as though the charges are kept on a curved path by an invisible string. The speed of the particle stays constant, only the direction of velocity changes. Here is an illustration showing how a charged particle moves in the magnetic Here is an illustration showing how charged particle may move in a magnetic field. Consider a particle that is moving perpendicularly to the magnetic field. As you can see in this figure, the velocity of the particle lies in the plane of the screen at any moment. The magnetic field always points into the screen. By applying the right-hand rule, we can see that the force always points towards the center of the circular path. It causes a centripetal acceleration, changing only the direction of the velocity of the particle without changing the length of the velocity. We can find the radius of the circular path by applying second Newton's law relating the magnetic force and centripetal acceleration. In this case, the magnetic field is perpendicular to the direction of the velocity, so the angle between them is equal to 90 degrees. 
the value of the force is Q times V times B. By the second Newton's law, the force is equal to M times A, where the centripetal acceleration is V squared over R. We can use this equation to solve for the curvature radius R of the path. It is equal to MV divided by QB. So we see that R is proportional to the linear momentum of the particle, M times V, and inversely proportional to the magnetic field as well as the charge of the particle. This is not all. We can also find the period it takes the particle to complete one full rotation. For that, we find the angular speed of the particle, which is simply equal to V over R. Using the expression for R, we find that the frequency of uh, rotation is equal to Q times V. So this angular speed, omega, has a special name, the cyclotron frequency. The name originates from the application of this formula at particle accelerators or cyclotrons, where magnetic fields are used to keep uh, charged particles on a curved path. The period of the motion is simply equal to 2 pi times r over v, or you can express it in terms of m, q, and b. What's interesting here is that both omega and t depend on the ratio of q over m. Each elementary particle, such as proton or electron, or atomic nucleus, has its own specific value of Q over M. This means that using magnetic field, we can classify various charged particles that penetrate it. Atomic nuclei of different chemicals have different ratios of Q over M. If these nuclei enter a region with a magnetic field, their trajectories will be bent with different curvature radii, and the nuclei will travel with different angular speeds. The nuclei thus can be identified by observing their trajectories and measuring the curvature of each trajectory proportional to Q over M. This principle is used in many types of particle detectors. They employ particle propagation through magnetic field created inside the detector to detect traces of chemical substances. For example, mass spectrometers look for traces of substances in a wide range of applications from chemical labs to airport security. In each of these applications, a magnetic field inside the detector bends the particles and measures their trajectory curvature. Suppose now we place a wire with current I inside magnetic field. The wire will also experience magnetic force. Because each moving charge carrier creating the current is deflected by the magnetic field. The total magnetic force on the wire generally depends on the shape of the wire. But suppose we take a small approximately linear element ds of the wire. The magnetic force dfb on the wire element can be found by summing q times v cross b exerted on each charge carrier. So therefore, the magnetic force on the element ds is simply equal to I times ds cross b. To obtain this equation, we recall that the magnetic force on each moving charge is Q times vd cross b, where Q is the charge of the charge carrier and vd is its drift velocity. If the element of ds is small enough, we can neglect its curvature and assume that it is approximately linear. We can also neglect variations in B in the vicinity of small ds. Then we need to first find force on a linear wire in a uniform B. If the linear segment has length L and area A, the number of the charge carriers inside the segment is equal to the lowercase n times A times L, where n is the concentration of charge carriers. The total force on the segment is the product of the force on one charge carrier and the number of charges. But we can also find the expression for the current through the segment. It is simply equal to the lowercase n times q times vd times a. We can further rewrite L times vector vd as the absolute value of velocity vd times the vector of L, where L is the vector of length L pointing in the direction of the current. Rearranging the products a little bit, we find the total force on a linear piece of the wire. 
vector of f is equal to the current i times vector l cross vector b. Again, l is a vector that points in the direction of the current. Its magnitude is the length l of the segment. If we now take a small element ds of a wire of an arbitrary shape, the force on this segment is dfb is equal to i times ds cross b. So we replaced L by ds. The total force of the wire can be obtained by integrating contributions of forces on each small segment. So total FB is equal to I, the current, which is the same at each element of the wire, times the integral of ds cross B. This vector equation is nothing but three separate equations for x, y, and z components f of b. For example, to obtain the x component of f b, we take the x component of the uh, cross product ds cross b and integrate it along the total length of the wire. You may wonder if this equation depends on whether the current is created by positive or negative charge carriers. For example, in the same magnetic field, the magnetic force on a negative charge carrier is opposite to that on the positive charge carrier. However, the same formula applies for both positive and negative charge carriers. The sign of the charge of the charge carrier doesn't matter. Suppose you are given a wire in which the current goes upward and is carried by positive charge carriers on the left-hand side in negative charge carriers on the right hand side. The product V cross B is pointing to the left for the positive charge carriers and to the right for the negative charge carriers. However, the force on the wire will be pointing to the left in both cases. This happens because the opposite direction of V cross B for the negative charge carriers is compensated by the additional minus sign in the expression for the magnetic force. To summarize, magnetic force on a nearly straight wire with almost no bending is equal to I times L cross B, and a force on a wire of an arbitrary shape connecting points A and B is obtained by integration of DS cross B along the full length of the wire.